Hello and welcome to the next lecture for the Wildlife Medicine and Conservation Certificate. Today we will talk about examination of wildlife and a basic health assessment in different wildlife species. On the title picture here, you can see it's an old picture uh, that was examination of a harpy eagle at the Blee Zoo. And you will see this picture again at a later time too when we're talking about capture and restraint and how to do this. So we will talk a little bit about the basics of physical examination, uh, the special challenges that this poses in wildlife. And then I will give you a lot of different examples in pictures and videos of different things that you can see and observe in your examination of wildlife. As a general, how to use this, if possible, feel free to pause the presentation uh, when it comes to new cases or images. Uh, try to make your own conclusions by looking at the images uh, before you then listen to uh, my, my commentary. Uh, in the end, I will also still give you a few recommended references, which is somewhat the most important thing you need for this extremely broad and diverse uh, field where we see so many different species and without references, unless you see only species that you've seen many, many times, um, your references are going to save you or you're lost. Um, so in general, when we do a clinical examination, we use a number of methods. And most times my students don't know what I mean when I ask, what's your first method you use to examine an animal? And I get blank stares, pun intended, because your first method and the first thing you generally do for any examination uh, is observation. So using your eyes, um, once you've exhausted your observation part of the examination, we generally get a little touchy and go over to palpation to feel lymph nodes, lumps, bumps, swellings, um, and the likes. We could also use auscultation, so listening to, of course, our heart rate, heart sounds, lung sounds, uh, as well as intestinal uh, sounds. And then last but not least, a very old school method that we use at times called percussion, uh, drumming on the animals, uh, no jokes aside, what tapping on body parts will tell us very simply is if the space behind where we tap is gas filled or fluid filled. And if the space is fluid filled, where it should be gas filled, for example, your lungs, that um, will tell us something. And the opposite would be where we uh, tap on the abdomen and we hear a very loud, hollow sound or a ping sound from bloat, for example. So gas where there in general should be fluid. In Wildlife examination, there are many, many challenges. In many, many cases, we will do a visual examination for quite some time before we go to any of the next step, um, which generally require capture, immobilization, restraint, um, be it physical restraint or chemical restraint, and um, high-risk anesthesia in order to actually get our hands onto these patients, which is why we will not do this unless it is warranted. So a lot of importance is on the visual examination. So the general approach to wildlife is hands-off. And your first step in any examination would be your anamnesis. Uh, gathering history as much as you can 
Um, depending on what you are working with, you will get nothing. For example, in wildlife rescue, we very often just receive a box with an animal in it and we have no idea where it came from, what's in it, or if it's even alive. Uh, but when you have captive patients, obviously you can get much more of a history and a background and depending on the abilities of your uh, animal carers, for example, you may get a very complete history. But many, many times we do not get much of a history in what we see at the BWRC. But when it comes to history, if you have somebody who can help you gather that information that may make or break the case. So do spend as much time as possible on gathering as much information as you possibly can. And we could literally spend a whole day talking about what sort of anamnesis questions would you ask because it depends on a million different factors. Um, so of course you want to know uh, why is this animal there, what sort of symptoms were observed and how long has this lasted, um, how did it start? How did it develop? Are there any other animals? A very important question is always if any other treatments have been given. Um, for us in Wildlife Rescue, a very important question is where did this animal come from? Because we potentially will try to return it there. Uh, and it will, of course, also guide us by knowing that in certain regions we may have certain diseases, for example. And another very, very important anamnesis question in wildlife rescue is how long have you had it? Because very often people have had these animals for a while before they bring them in, which changes what you have to do as well as your prognosis. Um, of course, the gender of the animal, the species, obviously influences what sort of anamnesis questions you would ask and what you would um, suspect. If you have a group of animals, are they all sick? So literally a million and one questions and you will cover this in your uh, normal species as well. Uh, you just have to adapt it to your wildlife species. So how do we do this? Some general guidelines or things you have to know is that wildlife by its nature will hide when they're sick. So naturally they do not want to look weak uh, because that may indicate to a predator that they are easy prey. Um, this makes it more difficult for you to see those signs of disease because they will quite literally hide them from you as long as they can. So you have to hone your observation skills to recognize even subtle little uh, changes. Another general rule why we practice the hands-off approach, um, wildlife is not used to humans and our mere presence will stress them very much so. In some high stress species, that alone can lead to shock, which untreated may actually kill them. Uh, so these are all reasons why we keep our distance, do our observation and keep our, keep our hands off as long as we can, um, unless we must intervene. So how can you tell something's wrong? I will mention this a few more times. It is quite challenging. Um, your tool are your eyes. Um, and yeah, the importance of animal care staff in captive facilities cannot be overemphasized because they are the ones that see these animals on a daily basis and know their normal behaviors, for example, which you as a veterinarian, if you come in uh, once a month, you will really have a much harder time um, recognizing the individuals and recognizing subtle changes. Uh, but yeah, you have to watch them quietly from a distance, but don't stare them down because staring them into their eyes is either, uh, yeah, it's an open threat. And if you do that to a predator, for example, a jaguar, you will trigger aggression and they will lunge towards you. If you stare down a prey animal, um, that is what a predator does before they eat them and it will stress them to the extreme. So you have to practice the sneaky look out of the corner of your eyes, very quiet, distant observation. So I will oftentimes spend up to 20 minutes standing at a distance 
where of course the animals ultimately know I'm there, but you stand quiet, you don't move, you minimize your profile and you just watch. And well, really, really important, which is why I will mention some more in the end too, is you need references or lots of experience to know what's normal. Um, I often get the question, teach me how to rescue animals. And I have to answer that you have to first learn all the biology and the normals for these animals, because I cannot just teach you how to rescue them unless you can properly do this assessment and you need to know the normal before you can tell an abnormal. And yeah, ask an expert first. So my biggest recommendation to the newbies to the field is network and get references and have your list of experts and phone numbers on hand that you can call um, when needed. So yeah, where to get advice is really uh, something important to try to determine as you get started or before you get started. Uh, in our case here in Belize, we have a 24 seven hotline, which of course is of not much use to you all in the States. But the point is that you too have local wildlife centers in your state, I'm sure, um, who you can find out and then um, get contacts so that you can get advice when you need it for a species that you have never seen before. Um, you should also check into the IWRC and the NWRA. And uh, those are associations that will give you an incredible wealth of information through networking. They host an annual conference. They have databases of rehabilitators who are basically in every state in the US. You have rehabilitators for different species. So with the help of these organizations, you can find out who is the closest by rehabilitator for the species that you may encounter. So here we're talking again about wildlife rescue and rehabilitation. So what do we look for? So observe first, don't touch. Most of what we're talking about today is all things to look for. So be all eyes. What you can see, your first challenge in many examinations will be, what is it? What is the species? Um, again, your references and your experts can help you with that. Um, your next challenge will be, what's the gender? We have a lot of cryptic species where you may not be able to determine the gender. And then very, very important is life stage. Is this a neonate? Is it a juvenile or is it an adult animal? Very simplistic. And um, if you look, for example, at this picture here, this is a classic example from wildlife rescue that I had to insert in here. This is a fledgling and these animals often get rescued when in fact they are being kidnapped because they do not need rescue. Um, their parents are close by, but people overlook them and just see this bird on the ground and imagine that it needs to immediately be rescued and carried to the next rescue center. But the response to this is actually observation, again, looking for uh, similar looking birds that will care for these fledglings. And what most people don't know is that many fledglings will spend up to a week on the ground uh, before they're fully flighted. And the parents during this time still care for them. It is a dangerous time. And in some cases you may have to pick them up and move them out of a yard with dogs and cats that can't be contained, for example. But in general, if you recognize that life stage, then you will recognize this animal actually does not need rescue. The next thing you look for, and that's the, the big stuff, the easy stuff, uh, is the animal's physical integrity. So those are usually things that are easily recognized as wrong 
uh, and that you can see from a distance. And I have a few pictures and examples for this. I have behavior and fact print because it is so important, but all of these things are equally important and you basically have to look at all of them simultaneously as quick as possible to, well, determine if you actually acutely need to intervene here now or not. There are many, many signs in posture, many of which are subtle as well. And again, I will have um, pictures, some. Uh, then you should assess body condition, which again, depending on your species, is quite different and occasionally also very difficult. Think of furry, fluffy, feathered animals, uh, where it is quite hard to see the actual body. Um, the state of care obviously refers uh, to captive animals, where um, you can observe, for example, that they're very soiled or covered in ectoparasites or matted fur as signs of a uh, inappropriate state of care. Uh, and then respiration again is in fat print because um, ideally that is one of the first things that you observe immediately to make sure a your animal is alive and is not an acute respiratory distress which could uh, mean that you actually need to proceed from observation to immediate intervention and life saving. So in a normal physical exam, of course, you will have a heart rate and you will have a temperature. Um, you will palpate your lymph nodes and more usually. In wildlife, quite often, we only monitor heart rate and temperature once they're under anesthesia, or if they come in near comatose. <coughs> because again, to restrain an animal just to get a temperature puts a lot of stress on this animal. And depending on the overall condition, uh, we can deduce from its behavior and overall state, whether it is suspect of a fever and we actually need to restrain and take the temperature. So now some examples here. Some of the easy things here on the left, this was a Scarlet Macaw chick during a health check in the field. Uh, and it's quite obvious, so here is a healthy foot. This is not the same bird, not even the same species, but it's a macaw and this is a macaw. And you see this guy is missing basically all of his toes, has multiple scabs on his uh, foot and the foot was basically congenitally deformed and very easy to recognize um, this problem. Here we have another type of breach of the physical integrity. This must have been caused by a machete. And so quite a sharp cut that came from there and didn't chop the top off. And this was accidental. So this was not on purpose. This happened most likely in chopping. And then the animal was found. So the animal was not brought in by the person who did the chopping, but we're reasonably sure that was an accident and she recovered. And this case of this bird uh, was deemed non-releasable because of a missing foot. And he is now housed at our best little zoo, the Belize Zoo, as a species ambassador. So more easy ones to see, two different Amazon parrots here. Um, their history was the same. They were co-housed with larger birds who bit them over the beak and uh, caused these beak injuries. And here you could maybe pause for a moment and take a look at these images and take a guess what caused these cuts here. We have one, two, three crocs, um, three different cases. And yeah, to give you the solution, this here is a classic machete cut. 
very tiny, minor, just cut the skin a little bit, topical, no big problem. This is already an old injury. You can see a bunch of fiber in here. The wound's already closed. Um, very minor. This year, however, another machete wound, uh, not as minor. The cut actually went through the femur. Uh, was also a little bit older. This was already after a little bit of cleanup had, had been started. Um, but yeah, we cleaned this up, closed it, and duct taped the leg to the tail for immobilization. And that worked. And the crocodile regained use of the leg and walked away one day. This, however, was not a machete. And if you look at it, you have one cut here, you have another cut here, you have a tiny little bit here, and you can't see there was another massive cut here that started here and went a little further. These are somewhat classic boat strike injuries. It's a tiny crocodile, um, and he was most likely spun under the propeller. So this is the first cut, the next cut, the next one. Um, you can see a little bit of intestine here. Um, we could also see part of the lungs. Um, but again, all of these did recover. Um, this obviously took more treatment, uh, but yeah, all three crocs were released and all of these are traumatic injuries, shot cuts. Uh, we've, I did not put an image in here of these cuts on manatees where boat strike is the most common injury to them. And it looks quite similar though, where you see these regular cuts that go over the body. Some other lumps and bumps and deformities. This is a green iguana hind leg here. You see this massive lump. Anybody knows what this was is? This is an abscess in a reptile. Reptile pus is not liquid. It is very hard and like cottage cheese is the description used for it. So this is the abscess actually debrided here. Again, quite easy to see if you pay attention and uh, compare both sides a general recommendation too especially if you don't know an animal look from one side to the other compare the good side to the other side um, to actually note the asymmetry and the lumps and bumps otherwise it can be overlooked so here another uh, crocodile example with a deformity which of course that is a little bit difficult to tell from a picture uh, because it could be in movement, but you have to take my word for it. It's not. This crocodile started with one kink in the spine and then continued to develop further one, two, three, and then it started kinking here as well. Ultimately, this uh, crocodile was euthanized. Um, in many cases of reptiles, the, or the first suspicion for this is always a uh, nutritional condition or metabolic uh, bone disorder, uh, which was not the case here. It was not nutritional um, because this crocodile came from a captive facility with good uh, nutrition, but this was renal failure. Um, So here another lump example. Unfortunately, the patient is very small. It's very hard to see. Um, I should have put in the first picture actually of the head where you could see that on both sides of the head, there were large protruding lumps that were a typical injury or uh, condition in turtles with an ear abscess. And this is actually the surgery draining the abscess. Here another lesion example and while all of these are observed lesions I have to apologize because there are several images where we're obviously already restraining the animal but you can see the lesions much better once we restrain them. Um, so this was an anteater, a tamandua, 
You can see the little lesion here on the nair. And anybody can guess what it is that we're doing here and why we're doing this? Again, feel free to pause in between. So this is under black light and we see fluorescence under black light, uh -huh, which makes us confirm a fungal etiology on um, these lesions here on this tamandua. So crucially important before you do anything and you um, intervene, you need to always assess the behavior um, and be sure that there are no, no extremely concerning behaviors. So here are a few classically described behaviors that should be concerning an animal that is very tame, um, out during the day when it's a nocturnal animal, uh, wandering aimlessly or one walking in circles, or an animal that is aggressive, trying to attack, um, or bad case scenario, an animal that's non-responsive, recumbent on the floor, potentially comatose. Those are all um, concerning behaviors. And then if we look at this here, do you know what this fawn is doing? What is this behavior? Does this fawn need rescue? Question mark. No, that fawn does not need rescue. That fawn is trying to be inconspicuous and hide while his mom is eating. And again, this is a common kidnapping case where hikers will find a baby fawn and because it is on the ground like this they think it is injured and it needs help and because it is a baby it will not run away and flee but it will just stay there uh, but what people need to know is that uh, the mom may stay gone for up to 12 hours and the fawn is fine and just needs to be left alone unless there are any open breaches of the integrity, uh, it's buzzed by flies and has maggots on it, for example, then those are signs that there is something wrong with it. But just a fawn sitting in the grass like this is perfectly fine. Um, yeah, our behavior could change in two major ways, right? It could either be hypoactive or hyperactive. Um, and in general, wildlife's response to us needs to be fear and flight. If that's not the case, there's something wrong. Or, of course, there are always multiple exceptions, and it's a baby. In a baby, you will not yet see this response, which is why it's so important that you can recognize your life stage. A, the species, and B, the life stage. Because when they're very young, their behavior is quite different from when they're adults, obviously. So look at this and think about what this could mean look at this behavior and posture so to speed it up this cow had rabies what you see here is the cow's recumbent lateral recumbency the neck is twisted and turned that's the torticollis and you can also see that there's some drool here so this was actually a rabbit cow um, that's what it can look like. Um, now I'm going to show you a video, hopefully. So it's very short. Uh, feel free to rewind and watch it again. Sorry for the noise. What do you think? So this fox has what looks to be a jaw cramp, is biting onto the cage door and is not reactive or not following his environment. And then he is seizing. So this was, sorry, that's my dog, a highly alarming intake video that I received that made me say, don't touch, I'll be right there. And guess what? This fox actually had rabies. Um, so never forget rabies when dealing with wildlife. It's a viral disease. 
The good news for us here first, our last human case was in the late 80s. Um, a human case means fatality. Um, our last case in domestic animals was over a decade ago, um, but we do have cases in livestock, aka cows, uh, sheep, and we've had an outbreak going on here. Uh, our main vector are bats, and then in early 2020, we actually detected this fox, the video I just showed you, that was highly suspicious, so we euthanized on intake without physical uh, restraint and then sent him in for testing and lo and behold, he was positive. So what do you do? A, you vaccinate, of course, your domestic animals. We do vaccinate warm-blooded uh, mammals as well. Sorry, I think the dogs have something. Um, and we are vaccinated for rabies as well. That does not mean that we are fully protected, but that means that if we ever get exposed, then we just need to get a booster. And yeah, the general recommendation, unless you're trained, is don't handle wildlife. And if you ever get bit or scratched, do not ignore it, record it. It may be embarrassing, it doesn't matter. If you ignore it and you were exposed to rabies and you don't do anything about it, you will die. Um, so report it. It may be embarrassing you got bit, but better get treated. So yeah, our concerns with wildlife restraint are obviously the animal safety as well as human safety and bites and scratches need to be avoided um, at all cost. Uh, we have to be weary of zoonotic diseases. Uh, and when our bites and scratches do happen, despite our best efforts to use personal protective equipment and safety protocols, then the most next important thing is to clean and disinfect them. Because if you don't, they will get infected. And if they get infected, then it could actually go extremely bad. So don't get bit. If you do get bit, clean it up good. And if it's a deep bite, go see a human doctor. So yeah, zoonosis has to be on your radar and we do have an entire uh, lecture on zoonosis. So back to observation of behavior and posture. Um, so we go from bright alert and responsive to quiet alert and responsive to depressed to obtund. You all know what that means. It means the animal is no longer responsive to normal stimuli, but it is only responsive to painful stimuli. So we pinch it deep, deep uh, in the toes and the tail, and then they may still move. Um, and you always have to be prepared for a response, even if you suspect an animal may be dead, it can still be alive and actually injure you, or you think it's comatose and it's not. So here we have a ferruginous pygmy owl. And if you look at this picture, you can see it's pretty classic. She has a head tilt. She has her right eye closed completely, likely a sign of pain. And the left eye is also halfway open only. So she's depressed, she has a head tilt, and she has pain in that eye. And then you can see this here is a wing wrap. Um, so she had a trauma to her right side and a broken wing and a head trauma, which is one of the most common injuries you will see in wildlife rescue. So here we have a cute guy. Uh, does anybody know the species? And then next question, what's the life stage? If you don't know the species, you're lost at life stage. And I can tell you, this is definitely not a fully grown animal. And we were wondering, how old is this guy? Is this guy independent already? Um, and you can see to his left here, there's a little ball. And then here, I think we have a video. Crucial behavior. We were so excited when we put in the ball and he actually drank on his own. Because that meant we don't have to bottle feed him anymore. Um, and he was very feisty, so it would have been difficult to bottle feed him. 
And what is this? I didn't say. It's a greater grissom. It's a mustelid species that is not very commonly seen here, nor in zoos. So here, another video and another behavior. Who knows what that means? They're hungry. So they want to eat. That is super. We hope to see that in our intakes uh, for birds. Um, those are emerald toucanets, by the way. Uh, these were uh, knocked down with a tree in a hurricane. Um, mom was killed and then we raised them and returned them uh, to their site of origin. Uh, this, the video did not work. What you see here is I am triggering a feeding response by pinching this bird here on the uh, commissure. And then the feeding response is actually the head starts bobbing up uh, in a vigorous feeding response. They will also vocalize squawk and flap their little wing stubbies here. Uh, so again, we hope to see that because it means they're still alert and responsive and hungry. And one of the crucial behaviors we need to see in wildlife, especially when we're trying to rehabilitate them, is they need to eat. So here, another example. Oh, there is another pygmy owl and that guy's hungry. Here we are a few days later and you can see what's he doing. Not so hard, so easy to tell, but that is threatening behavior. They're, they're moving the head back and forth and next they spread their wings out to try to make themselves look big. Uh, so the little guy actually did see me while I was trying to sneak that video and he's threatening me in the mirror. So here we have another special patient. Does anybody know this species? Again, if you don't know the species, it's probably difficult to assess what's normal or not normal and what is he telling us? So this is a Mexican hairy porcupine uh, or prehensile tailed porcupine and that is threatening behavior. So what you need to know, crucially important, you need to know all the behaviors for the species you're examining, but you definitely need to know their defenses, especially once it comes to getting your hands on there. And we will talk on how to restrain a porcupine in our capture and immobilization lecture, because it's quite interesting. And yeah, these guys will headbutt you uh, and their quills are very, very painful. So this you may be familiar with. It's a species we share. And again, this is aggression in a raccoon. Uh, how would you interpret this behavior? So again, just the second video. This is a young puma. You cannot really see it too well here, but she still had spots, who was captured by humans without any training. She was so weak. So what you see here is an extremely depressed animal. No? It's not really responding to me being right there. Um, and now here we are a couple days later. Yeah, so we're, we're now uh, alert, aggressive, and hungry. Uh -huh. So where to start? Um, I have to talk a little bit about respiration. So of course, respiration is, uh, is life-saving, crucially important. You should, in your first look, try to assess how the respiration is to detect respiratory distress. So things like open mouth breathing, standing with an extended neck, of course, increased respiratory frequency and increased respiratory effort. What you need to know is that in a resting bird, you will not see respiration. If you have a resting bird that has not exercised and it is visibly breathing heavily, that is dyspnea and that is most likely a life-threatening emergency. 
you need to watch this before you come too close though, because as soon as you approach them, of course the respiratory uh, rate is going to go up because they see you and that stresses them and that increases all the rates. Uh, the opposite extreme are your reptiles. They may not take a breath for five minutes or longer. Uh -huh. So uh, respiratory auscultation can be quite challenging. Um, so I generally start on the front end in my examination, um, if possible, with eyes, nose, and ears. Obviously in birds, we will not see the ears uh, unless there is an issue with it until we have them at hand. And yes, there is a lot to be seen in the eyes and we should have an entire um, lecture just on eyes. Um, and here just one example of a spiny tail, iguana eye with a cataract in it and a few more postures here for the birds. So I already showed you the picture of the little pygmy owl with a head tilt. This is something to look for and one picture is not enough because a head tilt is not if they do it briefly and then straighten out again, but if they stay to one side. And it can go to one side or as you can see here in this roadside hawk, uh, to the front and his head was basically by his feet and I was very surprised that he did recover uh, uh, and made it to release because I had never seen anybody have such a severe droop. He came in, his head was still was drooping and tilted but not that far down. Within a few hours he progressed to this and I was sure to find him dead the next morning but he did recover. Uh, yeah, torticol is the twist neck. You already saw that on the cow with rabies. <laughs> Any neurologic postures are always uh, concerning and usually carry a more grave prognosis. Uh, abdominal guarding posture is also very important. It's a curved up back line. It's unspecific. It just tells you there's abdominal pain and that is the area that you need to focus your examination on. Uh, and of course, recumbency is a posture that uh, is quite easy to recognize as potentially quite serious, um, unless they're sleeping. Uh, stargazing is another uh, posture that you can observe in uh, most species. It's particular in, in reptiles as well. So it's uh, the um, Greek word is opistotonus. It's a hyperextended neck. It's another neurologic sign. In iguanas, you have to know that when they threaten each other, they do this head bobbing motion as well. So again, from this picture alone, you couldn't tell uh, if this iguana was actually threatening somebody or uh, neurologic. Um, you have to believe me, he was neurologic and he did not survive. In birds, a very subtle sign are fluffed feathers, and it is something really important to look for because it basically tells you the bird's unwell. And because birds hide their symptoms very well, just fluffed feathers could be enough to tell you that this bird may be critically ill and about to die. So again, you can't take it from one picture. This bird here that I'm showing you is healthy because of course they spread their feathers and then they shake a little bit and put them back down, that's normal. But if they sit somewhere and they keep their feathers fluffed and you're looking at them and they stay that way and they don't respond, then they are most likely critically ill and you're dealing with an emergency. So bird signs, very subtle. Um, reptiles, very difficult to see any signs. So you also look for wing droops or shoulder droops. As you can see here, those will point us towards broken wings in our case, often in wildlife rescue. Um, when you have bilateral wing droops, then more commonly it's not broken, but the animal is just weak. So you wanna get an all around look at the animal because they're bilaterally symmetric and look for any asymmetries. 
some droops can be subtle and you may not see it until you compare both sides. So always compare left and right when you can. And yes, that is challenging because you're trying to do this sneakily without stressing the animal and without them really being too influenced by it, which is not very easy. So can anybody guess what can cause this sort of posture? So this is a parakeet, an olive-throated parakeet with a pretty bad feather uh, condition and extremely splayed legs and dorsal recumbency. And this can be caused by trauma. This can also be caused by malnutrition. Um, here, another case example of the Stygian owl. You can see here, she has an eye injury with bleeding in the iris here. You can also see bleeding in the posterior uh, chamber of the eye. And she's doing the defensive posture here, which makes that you cannot really assess wing droops often in raptors when they're doing the threatening because it's not very symmetric then. So do you see the asymmetry in this picture? It's not as easy, but if you don't see it here, you probably see it here. Um, so in her case, it's just a little tuft that's down. The eye actually, here they're almost the same, but you can still see that this pupil is a little more dilated. But again, this guy made a full recovery. Uh, here is another example of a bird that is fluffed. The posture, he's sitting on his haunches, his neck's not carried, his eyes are not opened properly, his mentation is not good. Uh, so this is a critically ill bird, which did in fact die within 24 hours of this picture, despite our best efforts. And the ID, this was a peregrine falcon. Oh, another video. I'm seeing we're about to run out of time. Can you see it? So that's... A, nerve damage in the left arm and he is buckling over and walking on his hands so proprioception is influenced there um, again he did recover so importance of body condition cannot be overemphasized in general you look for muscle mass over bony protrusions in birds we use the keel <coughs> you have this little scheme here and um, to give you an idea from emaciated to obese, uh, it varies. Water birds have more pronounced keels um, and parrots or pigeons, for example, have pretty flat uh, keels and more bulgy pectoral muscles um, here. But you assess the amount of muscle here to assess body condition in a bird. In mammals, we use the hips, the spinal processes, the ribs um, to see how much coverage is over that. And in reptiles and iguanas, we would look um, primarily over their hips and see how protruding the hips are. Once they lose more and more uh, muscle mass, we can also see it on the tail that goes from a round tail to eventually indented. In crocs, so in iguanas, we don't really look for the belly because the belly can be very distended and it means not very much. Uh, it just means how much they have in there right now, but their body condition is more, more in the hips. In the crocs, the first thing to look for is the neck. A croc is not supposed to have a neck. They are supposed to go straight from head to shoulder. So this little guy is actually emaciated. Uh, in snakes, we use the um, dorsal muscle parallel to the spine and the volume of that. It's a little bit similar to the keel, only on the other side, or how we feel it is what I mean. In turtles, it can be difficult to get. Um, and in sea turtles, there is a score that is used where you use the carapace length, the body weight, and a coefficient. Um, and yeah, depending on your species, you have to compare it to uh, 
the normal. And in your captive animals, you may see obesity, which is bulging out, but it is really, it can be quite difficult to assess body condition in turtles. A general is look at the eyes because in an emaciated animal, one of the last things that will be taken down is the retrobulbar fat, uh, at which point the eyes will become very sunken. Um, why is the body condition so important? If you have an extremely low body condition, you know this animal was sick for an extended period of time. So your prognosis goes down with the body condition, basically means the animal has been out there for quite some time, can't cope with it. Now it is so weak that somebody was able to pick it up. Um, it's quite different how you interpret your um, observations, whether it's a bird, a mammal, or a reptile. Obviously, all of their physiology, their behaviors, and their stress responses are very different. Uh, so is their pain response. So in birds, you will detect fractures pretty easily. In reptiles, it's quite challenging because they will still move. They will still use the limb. Um, and then I have the tamandua here as a mammal exception, where I have seen two of them walk on broken bones as well. So their pain response is, is quite um, subtle as well. Here's some more obvious deformities. Uh, so uh, lumps on this little songbird, um, conjunctivitis here, and the note, any respiratory signs in birds or reptiles have to be treated as an emergency. Um, their respiratory systems are much more fragile compared to mammals. And in a mammal, you may observe for a while. In a reptile or in a bird, you will not observe because it is the respiratory infections are quickly life-threatening and require um, so-called aggressive treatment. Just a few pictures of feather condition here from a colleague, a uh, young macaw pushing in his feathers. Here's some stress bars on feathers. Here, obviously not good feather condition, um, something that obviously you, you assess in your distance examination. You can already see that. And this is something where you should pause and you should guess a little bit what causes this. Because if you forget everything else about this lecture, this you need to remember. This bird has something wrong. It has feather yellowing. So the markings are okay here and here. That's normal. What's not normal is the yellow discoloration here, 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 here. From here to here, Amazon parrots are supposed to be as green as the Amazon. What it tells you is that the bird, oh, I took it away, caused by malnutrition fat soluble vitamin deficiency this is a disease of captive animals so you know this bird was captive when it shows feather yellowing and that quality is deplorable it doesn't always look the same with the point of this image and i think i have one more they will eventually turn completely yellow and this will eventually kill the bird as well and most owners do not know they just say oh my bird is turning yellow and I say, oh, I know your bird has been malnourished for a long time. So what all do we look for again? We look for integrity. We look for respiration, posture, the symmetry, behavior, and then eyes, nose, ears, vent, feathers, etc. All of that really fast from a distance without trying to influence the animal too much because the big challenge is as soon as you appear there, you change their behavior uh, significantly. You increase all of their rates and you cause stress. So just a case example here that actually belongs into next week's uh, class. This guy was found on the roadside. Feather condition, something happened here. So our first suspicion with roadside is of course hit by car, but he had a run-in with the scissors before. So those are clipped feathers. Here, another case example of a lameness. 
So what makes us suspect um, broken bones is non-use of limb, which was the case here. Um, this was a captive animal, which made this a bit unusual. So here is the break. Uh, in captive animals in general, you should not see fractures as we see them in wildlife rescue. No, if you do see them, you need to check the cage. And we don't have enough time to talk enough about enclosures and all the things you need to look for there. Um, but it is crucially important to then find out why did they get broken in captivity where that should be eliminated. So yeah, animal welfare, this was for our wildlife officers here, includes not just physical, but also phys uh, psychological well-being, and we have to avoid unnecessary suffering. And we have these sad cases where euthanasia is the most humane choice for some of these animals that are brought in, and then that choice is reserved to veterinarians. How can we tell their basic needs are met? of course, by appropriate natural diet, water, shelter, protection from the elements, appropriate size of the enclosure with companionship and um, enrichment, uh, extremely important. And here just some examples, not from me, but uh, what you can see in um, uh, the US quite frequently in captive birds, feather plucking, um, this can be caused by boredom alone, but it is not. There are other causes for this, obviously. Um, I just use it as a lead in. It could be that they're just bored and all they need is enrichment. So how do you assess an enclosure? You want it to be large. You want it to enable the animals to move normally. You want the animals to be able to hide as well and have privacy to just give you a few of these uh, key things I look for um, on first look. What we see very often, and we'll talk about that more later too, is malnutrition, inappropriate cage sizes, bad perches, terrible wing clips, crowded enclosures, but no socialization of social animals and no enrichment. So what's important to remember is learn your limitations. If you've never seen that species before, do not try ask somebody who does know because a lot can be done wrong if you don't know the normals and you make assumptions. Um, stay safe. Next thing, if you are not experienced with that species, get help uh, to not endanger yourself. Hone your fine observation and practice that assessment from a distance. As invest in your references and networking um, before, if you know what you're up against, then spend your time to read all about the biology and physiology and normal behavior before you go see that patient. Um, and yeah, examinations in public are extremely challenging because you have extremely high stress. You have the public who wants to see the animal is about to go crazy. Um, they are about the most difficult. And then when you're dealing with dangerous animals in public, it gets even worse, AKA jaguars or pumas or primates. So with that, in the last minutes, um, some references that I wanted to share with anybody who's interested in Belizean wildlife. Some of this also covers a little bit of Northern Guatemala, so applies to both of us. We have the Traveler's Guide here. We have the Birds of Belize. We have a special guide for Snakes of Belize. Uh, we have two more here for identification of amphibians and reptiles. Here, another one I mentioned, identification is your first challenge in our field. Uh, so references are crucial. Um, and then some websites that we use all the time. We have one here that is for our Belizean legislation, which is quite important. And then we have one that lists all of our species. But these two here, I highly recommend you check into because uh, they are not Belizean specific. They're actually not at all about Belize. They're more from North America. They give you basic biological information about the species. So you need to know what species you have and you need to know the Latin name. And then on these websites, you can find whatever information has been given for them. This also highly recommended, Living with Wildlife, uh, Reading on Coexistence. I picked these up for a few dollars on Amazon. So 
Uh, and the last one here is from the IWRC and NWRA, uh, an entire book on answering the phone regarding wildlife emergency calls. Um, to tell you how complicated that field is. It's a very thick book and highly recommended. And of course, there are lots of veterinary references and I see I'm running out of time. So I encourage you to ask me for a list of references because there are a lot more um, there um, and also depending on your special interests. And so with that, I say thank you. My hour is up. Please ask questions um, via email. Um, find us on uh, our website or on Facebook as well. And yeah, ask away. I hope you learned something. Thank you.